Imagine transforming this into this. That's Nevada's $16 billion plan. Pump Pacific Ocean water 170 miles inland. Create 1,500 square miles of artificial lakes in the middle of the desert. An inland sea larger than Rhode Island. But here's the problem. The last time someone accidentally created a desert lake just south of here, it turned into one of America's worst ecological disasters. This project would do it on purpose. So is this engineering ambition or the next Salton Sea? Let's find out. The idea of pumping Pacific water inland has been circulating for years in speculative studies and online concept explainers, often informally called the Little Pacific. The concept is often attributed to R.B. Proveen, described in online materials as a former U.S. Department of Energy manager. The scale is genuinely insane. We're talking about 1,500 square miles of water surface appearing in one of the driest places on Earth. Nevada gets only 7 to 9 inches of rain on average per year. Everything evaporates faster than it hits the ground. No proper rivers, no lasting lakes, just desert. But this project claims it can change that forever. Here's how it would work. Start on California's Pacific coast with massive desalination plants. Use reverse osmosis technology to strip the salt from the seawater, producing fresh water that can actually be used. Then comes the hard part, moving it inland. The southern route would run through existing infrastructure like the All-American Canal and Coachella Canal systems. These are already moving water through the region, so the idea is to integrate with what's already there. The eastern route is more ambitious. Water would flow through the Mojave Valley, following the old, mostly dry riverbed of the Mojave River. From there, it climbs through the Amagosa Valley before emerging right at Nevada's border. The Mojave River, by the way, flows mostly underground today. Its surface channels stay dry most of the time, except after rare floods. Once inside Nevada, the water spreads through dried basins of ancient lakes, places like Amagosa, Reese, Big Smoky and Monitor Valleys. These aren't random locations. Millions of years ago, these were actual lakes. The land is literally designed to hold water. It's just been bone dry for thousands of years. The infrastructure includes 500 miles of new canals layered on top of 1,000 miles of natural drainage channels. When fully operational, you're looking at what would essentially be Nevada's own Mediterranean. The total price tag? $16 billion. Here's how it breaks down. $4 billion for 20 gigawatts of solar panels. You need massive amounts of energy to run this system. $4 billion for reverse osmosis desalination plants on the California coast. $6 billion for canals and water infrastructure, the pipes, aqueducts and channels to move the water and $2 billion for pumping stations and power systems. For example, lifting roughly 317 billion gallons to an elevation of about 3,300 feet would require hundreds of megawatts to several gigawatts of power on average, depending entirely on how fast the water is moved. The often cited 6 gigawatt figure only applies if you try to move that volume in a very short time frame. That's why the solar component is so critical. Both California and Nevada have abundant sunshine, so, in theory, the energy is there. It's worth noting that this entire cost breakdown comes directly from the project's own estimates. And in megaproject history, early numbers like these almost always reflect best-case scenarios, not final, real-world costs. Proponents say this isn't just about water. It's about revenue. The desalination process produces brine, highly concentrated salt water. Instead of treating it as waste, they claim you can extract valuable minerals from it. Lithium for batteries, magnesium, boron, rare earth elements. The logic? A desalination plant that also functions as a mineral extraction facility could offset some of the system's operating costs. They point to California's Salton Sea as proof. Geothermal plants there are already pulling lithium from underground brine, and it works. Beyond minerals, there's talk of agricultural development in newly irrigated valleys, real estate booming around new lakefronts, and economic benefits potentially measured in the trillions. So where does the project stand? Nowhere. 
As of today, there is no confirmed government funding, no regulatory approvals, no environmental impact assessments, no construction timeline. It's entirely conceptual. The proposal has generated plenty of YouTube videos and headlines, but zero concrete progress. No politicians are championing it. No federal agencies are reviewing it. It's an idea on paper, and that's where it's likely to stay. The biggest problem? Physics. Nevada's climate is brutal. In summer, temperatures regularly exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Evaporation rates are off the charts. Any open body of water in Nevada loses liquid faster than almost anywhere else in the country. Even if you fill these ancient lake beds, the water starts disappearing immediately. You need constant refilling just to maintain levels. It's like trying to fill a bathtub with the drain open. Then there's the salt problem. Without an outlet to the ocean, salt accumulates. Over time, salinity levels rise, the ecosystem collapses, and you're left with a toxic dead zone. Sound familiar? Because that's exactly what happened just a few hours south in California's Salton Sea. We'll get to that cautionary tale in a moment, but first we need to understand something important. This isn't the first time someone proposed reshaping the American West with imported water. For over 70 years, engineers have dreamed of continental-scale plumbing projects. Almost all of them failed. The history of the American West isn't just about settling a territory. It's about trying to rewrite geography itself. Engineers here weren't building infrastructure. They were attempting to change the climate. Throughout the 20th century, there was this genuine belief that if you just moved enough water, you could force rivers to flow where they'd never flowed before. You could turn deserts into farmland. You could make nature bend to human will. Nevada, desperate for water, was always first in line for these proposals. And every time they went nowhere. The most famous of these schemes was the North American Water and Power Alliance, or NAWAPA for short. In 1964, the Ralph M. Parsons Corporation, an engineering firm in Pasadena, California, produced a feasibility study that seriously described a system of 369 separate components. Dams, pumping stations, canals, tunnels, and what would have been the tallest planned reservoir in the world. The idea? Take water from the rivers of Alaska and British Columbia, haul it across the Rocky Mountains, send it down through the entire west into 33 US states, seven Canadian provinces, and three Mexican states. For Nevada, where everything evaporates faster than it appears, this was a proposal on the level of a new era. If Nawapa had been launched, the state would have received so much water it could literally expand cities, start large-scale agriculture, and build neighbourhoods in places where today there's only rock and sand. The expected length of the entire system? 8,000 miles. That's the distance from London to Beijing. Except here, we're talking about infrastructure for water. The cost? $100 billion in 1964, roughly $1.1 to $1.5 trillion today. For comparison, that puts Nawapa in the same order of magnitude as the entire interstate highway system, one of the largest public works programs in US history. The project required 200 million sacks of cement, 30 million tons of steel, 100,000 tons of copper and aluminium, and a 30-year construction timeline. Parsons argued it would pay for itself within 50 years through water and electricity revenues. Nawapa collapsed under its own weight. Canada had no intention of giving up its rivers. Environmental groups began protesting before the project was even approved. The cost was impossible for that era. And interstate politics made coordination a nightmare. Historian William Du Bois called it defeated by its own grandiosity. By the 1970s, Nawapa was dead, fired away in the folder labelled, maybe one day. But it wasn't the only dream. Throughout the mid-20th century, there were repeated proposals to build trunk canals from the Columbia River in the Pacific Northwest. The idea was to move part of the region's abundant water into Nevada, Arizona, and California. Engineers produced pump layouts, canal models, and dozens of irrigation calculations. But like Nawapa, it went nowhere. Too expensive, too many interstate conflicts, too much environmental opposition. Another fantasy? Mississippi River Pumping West. Using the Mississippi River as a liquid conveyor belt. Take as much water as you need, 
pump it west, and turn the Great Plains and deserts into oases. Again, extensive calculations. Again, political and economic barriers killed it. Every few decades, someone revives these continental water transfer dreams. They generate headlines, investor presentations, and political buzz. But engineering reality, ecology, and politics always win. Failed megawater projects share common traits. Too ambitious. Interstate conflicts. No clear funding source and political fragmentation. Here's the thing. Not all water megaprojects failed. A few actually worked. And they show us exactly why Nevada's Pacific Pipeline won't. This one succeeded. Colorado River Aqueduct. Conceived by William Mulholland and designed by Frankie Weymouth, was the largest water supply line in the United States when it was built. It stretched 242 miles from Parker Dam in Arizona to Lake Matthews in western Riverside County, California. A $220 million bond was approved in 1931. Work began in January 1933 near Thousand Palms. Construction finished in 1935 and water first flowed on January 7, 1939. The project employed 30,000 people over eight years, as many as 10,000 working simultaneously. It was the largest public works project in Southern California during the Great Depression. The Colorado River aqueduct required building Parker Dam and five massive pumping stations to lift water over mountains. And here's the key. It still operates today. It still supplies water to the Los Angeles metropolitan region, it works because it had state-level political backing, incremental construction, and realistic engineering. Another one? The California State Water Project, built in the 1960s and 70s, this system moves water more than 700 miles across California, with its backbone, the California Aqueduct, stretching about 444 miles from north to south. The projects that succeeded had a few things in common. Unified state-level political support, incremental construction over decades, realistic engineering within known technology, and clear economic benefits that justified costs. NAWAPA? Continental scope, international conflicts, no funding mechanism. Nevada's Pacific Pipeline, interstate water politics, no federal backing, speculative revenue model, unproven at this scale. It follows the failed pattern, not the successful one. But the real reason Nevada's project should terrify anyone is California's Salton Sea. Because it's a perfect example of what happens when you create a desert lake without thinking through the consequences. In 1905, engineers were building an irrigation canal from the Colorado River toward California's Imperial Valley. Everything was going according to plan until the river flooded. It tore through an earthen dam and rushed into a gigantic depression far below sea level. For two years, the water flowed non-stop. By the time engineers stopped it in 1907, a new sea had appeared on the map, the Salton Sea. At first, people saw it as a miracle. Resorts sprang up, marinas, fishing camps. By the 1950s, the Salton Sea was a booming tourist destination. But the sea had no outlet. Every drop of water that entered stayed there forever. And as agricultural runoff poured in, mixed with pesticides, fertilizers and salts, the chemistry got worse and worse. Evaporation in the desert is extreme. Water vanished into the air. Salt stayed behind. Salinity climbed year after year, eventually surpassing ocean levels, then doubling it. Fish started dying. First small die-offs, then massive ones. Thousands of dead fish washing up on shore in stinking piles. Algae blooms appeared. In the heat, oxygen levels crashed. Fish suffocated. The smell of hydrogen sulfide carried for dozens of miles. Tourism collapsed. Today, the Salton Sea is an ecological disaster zone. As water levels drop, the exposed lake bed releases toxic dust, salt, pesticides, selenium, heavy metals, into the air. Dust storms made of poison. Surrounding communities, mostly low-income families, suffer from skyrocketing rates of child asthma and chronic respiratory disease. The Salton Sea wasn't planned, but Nevada's Pacific Pipeline would intentionally create the same conditions. Endoraic basins, no outlet, extreme evaporation, rising salinity, it's the Salton Sea on purpose. 
Nevada's water problems are real. The Colorado River is under stress. Lake Mead's levels keep dropping. Las Vegas and surrounding communities face genuine long-term water challenges. But the solution isn't pumping the Pacific Ocean 170 miles inland. Real solutions are already happening. Water recycling programs in Las Vegas that reclaim nearly every drop used indoors. Conservation measures, facility upgrades at Lake Mead, agreements between states to share limited resources more efficiently. These aren't flashy. They don't generate $16 billion headlines, but they work. Nevada's Pacific Pipeline means very different things to different people. To engineers, it's innovation. To ecologists, it's the next Salton Sea. To economists, it's $16 billion with no clear return. To tribes connected to the Amagosa region, including Western Shoshone, Southern Paiute, and the Timbisha Shoshone of nearby Death Valley, it raises serious concerns about culturally significant lands and groundwater. Which perspective is right? Probably all of them. The American West was built on audacious water projects. Some, like the Colorado River Aqueduct, worked. Most, like Nawapa, didn't. Nevada's Pacific Pipeline will almost certainly join the long list of desert dreams that stayed on paper, because moving water across a continent isn't just an engineering challenge. It's a political, ecological, and economic puzzle that no one has solved in 70 years. And maybe that's not a bad thing. So what do you think? Should Nevada gamble billions on a man-made sea, or invest in proven solutions like water recycling and conservation? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this deep dive, hit the like button. It really helps the channel. And subscribe if you want more Megabuild stories that sound impossible, because some of them are. Thanks for watching.